If I was to ask you, what is your purpose? What is your purpose in life? If I were to ask you, what does success look like for you? If you were to be at the end of your life and to look back and say, was it a good life? Was it successful? What does that look like? How would you quantify that? How do you know if you're on the right track? Simply, what is the whole point of life? There are philosophers who have dedicated plenty of years of study to this very question, why? Why is man? Who is man? All those questions. And I just want to remove the mystery from it today. Here's the main thing I want you to know today. You were created to live for God. You were created to live for God. If the kids are following along on their worksheets, you're going to see the fill in the blanks are from this phrase. It's the first one. You were created to live for God. When God created man and woman, he created them to glorify him. All the famous paintings in the world, the Mona Lisa, the the sculpture of David, all these things, these artists created it to their own glory. When we look at the Mona Lisa, we give credit to da Vinci. When we look at these sculptures, we give credit to the artists. All of creation, everything from the world to the intricacy of the human cell, was created to glorify God, that we might praise him for his awesome wonder and power. So if you wonder, what is the whole purpose of your life? You were created to glorify God. You were created to reflect his glory and goodness. Practically where we are in Nehemiah, that's what Nehemiah and the Jews in Jerusalem were trying to get back to. All of Jerusalem had been destroyed because they had given themselves over to their own desires. They had traded God for other makeshift gods. They had given in to sin, and they were destroyed. They hadn't always glorified God, and now their city was ruined. But now they do desire to love and follow God, and they set out to rebuild and re-glorify God with their lives. But when they set out to do that, there were some people who were against him. Let's back up a little bit. Chapter 4, verse 1 starts off like this. Now when Sanballat heard that they were building the wall, he was angry and greatly enraged. And he jeered at the Jews. And he said in the presence of his brothers and of the army of Samaria, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they restore it for themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they finish up in a day? Will they revive the stones out of heaps of rubbish and burned ones at that? Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him and said, Yes, what they are building, if a fox goes up on it, he will break down their stone wall. The Jews in Jerusalem are are desiring to live for God, what they were created to do. They were created to glorify God. But these Tobiah and Sanballat are, are opposed to them. They are kind of against what they are doing, which leads me to my first point. Living for God will seem crazy. Living for God will seem crazy to the watching world. Necessarily for the people here in Jerusalem who are building these walls, the people on the outside are like, what are they doing? This city was destroyed. Why are they trying to rebuild this one? They'd probably be better off if they just went and built a new one. But we have to remember, the city walls were in ruins because people had turned their backs on God. The walls needed to be rebuilt as a symbol of their dedication to the Lord. Historically, in the Old Testament, Jerusalem was the city of David. This is God's, one of God's favorite cities if he had one. It certainly wouldn't be Phoenix. I think that's why it's so hot here. Definitely not one of God's favorites. And with every stone that the Jews are putting in place, they are recommitting their lives, recommitting the life of the city, and just the commitment of the entire Jewish people back towards alignment with God. And to those on the outside, their rebuilding efforts look like rebellion against the norms. For them to rebuild these walls, it looked like maybe they were trying to raise up a coup to fight the Persian army. And that rubbed them wrong. And practically, they viewed it as a threat. So they mocked the work of God that Nehemiah and the Jews were doing. They mocked it. What are these guys doing, these feeble Jews? Are they going to rebuild it in a day? Are you kidding me? If a fox went on that wall, it would come crumbling down. Those are some of the things they said said as they were mocking the work of the Jews. But let me be clear, whether you are 5 or 75, living for God seems just as crazy to the watching world today. It does. Because what is the goal of living for God? Well, 
When we desire to live for God and we're going to love Jesus with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbor as ourselves, the thing that we're really doing is we're trying to bring God more and more glory and we're trying to see more and more people repent of their sins and worship and obey Jesus. That's the whole reason we live that way. The reason we love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength isn't because it makes us feel good, but because when we do that, we are in right relationship to God. We are glorifying Him. And so to that means, we align ourselves, our families, our communities, and the world towards obedience and worship to God. Practically, if I could sum it up into one sentence, one little phrase, what is the whole point? Why do we want to live for the glory of God? Because we want to see the world saved through Jesus Christ. The whole world, every corner of the world, we want it to be saved, that every person would repent of their sins and put their faith in Jesus. And that seems very strange to people. So they say things that they do not understand. Practically, in our text today, we saw Stan Ballot call them feeble Jews. I wonder if you know that word feeble. Weak, silly, childish. They call them feeble Jews. The work seems too big. I wonder if where you're sitting today, the idea of the world being saved by Jesus, everybody calling upon the name of the Lord, I wonder if that task seems too big for you. I wonder if you go, there's no way that we could ever do that. For Sam Ballot, the work seemed too big. And the Jews seemed too weak. But Community Life Church, let me say it like this. The work is big. I desire for Community Life Church to be a beacon of hope in North Peoria. I do. That if we holding our part of the line and the other churches around us holding their part of the line, that Phoenix would grow to be a city that glorifies God in all that it does. I desire that. And that is a big task. But we serve a big God. We serve a God who strengthens us and fuels us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And I'll say this, I will take Holy Spirit-fueled strength over the strength of this world any day. What seems feeble to man is often what God uses to display his great strength. I can't tell you the amount of times that you see in the Old Testament where God used something little to do something big. You have the story of David and Goliath where David knocks down a giant with just a sling and a stone. We see Gideon take 300 men and defeat thousands of people. God will often use the weak and feeble to display just how great he is. The next thing they accuse him of, accuse the Jews of, is will they finish up in a day? We live in a society where you can have everything you want. Practically speaking, I order my groceries, they will be delivered to my house before I get home. I can have anything I want right now and I don't have to work that hard for it. You could order yourself slushies right now and have them delivered to the church. Instant gratification is everywhere. And so the work of the Lord sometimes seems frustrating to us because it doesn't happen overnight. And they're, as they're mocking the Jews, they say that. Are they going to build it in a day? It does take long. But the work of the Lord, though it may not be immediate, it is lasting. Everything built on this earth will eventually go away. But the things of the Lord last forever. How about the, this kind of mocking that they do? They say if a fox goes up on it, it'll come crashing down. They're trying to accuse the Jews of saying that what they are building is just fragile. But Community Life Church, I don't want you to think for one moment that the work of God today is fragile. The church may seem fragile, but the believer knows that the church is built on the blood and sacrifice of Jesus Christ, who is the ultimate strong foundation upon which whatever is built in his name is stronger than anything rooted in this world. I'll tell you, there is more strength in a believer who's going through chaos, but rooted in Jesus, than the most secure person whose life is built on something other than Jesus. What we are building is built on a firm foundation. It doesn't matter how it looks. And because of God's goodness and firm foundation, believers shouldn't look like the rest of the world. Living for God will seem crazy to the rest of the world. But if we know truths about God and we have repented of our sins and put our faith in Jesus, our lives should reflect that. I was reading today in Proverbs 27, it says this, 
As in water, face reflects face, so the heart of man reflects the man. More than just our obedience, more than just doing the right thing, God desires our hearts. And if our hearts belong to him, if our hearts belong to Jesus, our lives should look like Jesus. And as we think about the life of Jesus, Jesus absolutely was near to sinners. He hung out with tax collectors and sinners. But understand, though Jesus had a heart for the broken, he did not look like the broken. Though Jesus had a heart for sinners, his life was not consumed by sin. It was different. If our hearts really belong to God, we should grow to look more and more like Christ throughout our life. And that looks like obedience, absolutely. If you wanted to know what does it look like to live for God, well, it's at least doing what God says we are to do. It's at least that. Well, how would we know what God says to do? Well, I'm glad you asked. God gave us this beautiful thing called his Bible, the Holy Word of God. We can read this and go, oh, God wants me to live like this and not like that. We should also get really good at not doing what he says not to do. For no other reason than God said so. I wonder if any of the kids in the room have ever heard their parents say that. Hey, you got to go do this thing. And they say, why? 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 And eventually the parent runs out of answers and goes, because I said so. Because I said so. That's why. No, no other weak parents in the room, just me. That's fine. God has the ultimate because I said so. When you are God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, you get to say, because I said so. But do you know that practically each one of the commands that God gives us is because it's what's best for you? Do you know that God doesn't only want what's good for you, God wants what's best for you. And the best thing for you is that you would follow and obey him. And practically, it works out better for you when you do that. So we should at least obey God. But what else does living for God look like? Well, it looks like sacrifice. And this is what seems most crazy to people who are watching us. Because the world is totally fine with us obeying God, loving our neighbor as ourselves, not lying, not killing. The world is on board with that. Where the world really looks at us and thinks we're crazy is when we start sacrificing for this God that we love. And we say here at Community Life Church often that love is sacrifice. Nothing less, maybe nothing more. Because what we're willing to sacrifice for is what, we're, is what we love. That is where our heart is. You do not sacrifice for something you do not love. And so we sacrifice our time, our talents, and our treasures for the glory of God. What does it look like for us to sacrifice our time? Well, when we are glorifying God the way we should be, we give God our time as a priority, not just our leftovers. This means that we prioritize our time with God and sacrifice it. Rather than getting an extra few hours of sleep on Sunday, we're going to be at church worshiping God, sacrificing our time. Rather than having something planned all the time for our own means, we're going to prioritize time in the Word, time in life groups, time on service teams. We'll sacrifice our talents that God gave you the gifts and abilities you have, not so that you could use them to make a lot of money, but so that you could use them to glorify him. I can't tell you how many people serve on service teams in this church. And there's a wide array of people. As I look around the room, I think about the different teams I know people are on. And we got people on kids teams, the security teams, the welcome team, the welcome center team, the counting team. There's people who literally have to count and tally the money that comes into the church. People sacrifice their talents to be used to the glory of God. And lastly, people sacrifice their treasures. The world would think that we're crazy, that God commanded us to give 10% of our income back to him. The world would say, oh my gosh, you're 10% poorer. And I would say, you're missing it. That when we give our 10% to God, he uses that more mightily than I ever could. And God is more, uh, my provider, and he, if he wanted me to have 10% more, he'd give me 10% more. But it is right that we sacrifice our time, our talents, and treasures for the glory of God. We sacrifice making more money or having more things to better worship and trust God and fuel his work. 
So if our hearts are rooted in something outside of this world, then our lives should not look like the rest of this world in the day-to-day. Practically speaking, if your citizenship is in heaven, if your heart belongs with Jesus, don't get too comfortable here in this world because we're not meant to be like this world. We're meant to be like it is in heaven. We just prayed that with the kids. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So because we were created to live for God, here's my second point. Our actions matter to God. Practically, what we do matters to God. Both obedience and disobedience matter. I recall a conversation I had with somebody one time that says, isn't the whole thing of every religion just pretty much be good and be kind to one another? Isn't the golden rule pretty much everything? And obviously the answer to that is no. But even if that was just it, if all of living for God was just the golden rule, do we even do that? At best, we do it sometimes. There's no way that we all golden rule to the best of our abilities. There's no way. And even that, we're called to so much more. Our actions dictate our heart, and God desires our heart. Do you know that you all worship something? God desires that that worship would be him, but all too often in our sin, we give our worship to other things. And it may seem like those who aren't living for Jesus have it better, but trust me, that's only temporary. In fact, if I look around, it seems like, man, some of these guys are golfing on Sunday mornings, and that sounds like a pretty good time. Who am I kidding? I'm not that good at golf. We may look around and think that the non-believers around us have a better life than us. Let's just, let me just tell you, that's just because that they've put their hope in something temporary where we have placed our hope in something eternal. I've said this before, and I'll keep saying it as long as you all allow me to be the pastor here. It is better to be uncomfortable in this world inside the will of God than to be really comfortable in this world outside the will of God. Friends, don't get comfortable here. This is not our forever home. Our forever home is rooted in heaven with Jesus. Those that oppose Nehemiah use their comfort in this world to taunt the work of Jews. Uh, Sanballat and Tobiah are looking from their comfy homes and going, what are these feeble Jews doing? We have it so good over here. They probably are making fun of Nehemiah because he was kind of like the right-hand man to the king living in luxury, and he gave that up to go rebuild this city. They're probably making fun of them because they sit in comfort, not recognizing that what Nehemiah is doing is placing his comfort in something bigger than himself. Look how Nehemiah responds in verse 4. He says, Hear, O God, for we are despised. Understand that sometimes when you choose to live for God in this world, you will be despised. People will look down on you and shun you. There are places in this world where you could be persecuted just for proclaiming Jesus' name. Nehemiah says, We are despised. And then he prays this. Turn back their taunt on their own heads and give them up to be plundered in a land where they are captives. What's interesting is Nehemiah prays something that we already see God do. The first thing he says is turn their taunt on their own heads. One of the worst things that can happen to you is that God gives you your heart's desire. Do you know that? That one of the worst things that God could do is give you your heart's desire. Because when we get exactly what we want, oftentimes we will turn our back on God. When we get the thing that we think will make everything better, if you've ever found yourself saying the phrase, if only I had blank, everything would be fine. If I could just have blank, well, then I know I'd be okay. The worst thing that could happen is if we got that thing, because if we got that thing, that would become our source of hope. Practically speaking, that thing becomes our master. And let me tell you, whatever you put that thing in, whether that was money, family, people, resources, status, It eventually lets you down. Even if you were to live your life perfectly, you were able to make all the money in the world, you were able to have all the position in the world, have the best family in the world, when you got to heaven, it would not be an answer for your sin. And so it ultimately let you down. Stand before God and he says, hey, you are guilty of sin. What do you say? I was CEO of my company. I had a good family. I have a lot of wealth. At the end of the day, living for God's glory is the only thing that really matters. 
So what we see God doing is, though they are taunting from their place of comfort, God will turn it on them in the years to come. But then Nehemiah prays that they would be held captive. What's interesting is sin already has us held captive. There's a little kid's story that talks about the little white lie. Anybody remember that story, the little white lie story? And it's this little white lie monster. And this kid tells a lie, and they have to keep building on that lie because the only other option is to tell the truth, and they can't do that. And so this little white lie turns into this giant, big, ugly monster. Practically, sin holds us captive that same way. If we give in to the idea that we have to lie, we then have to keep lying, and we become a slave to our own lie. If you become caught up in materialism, people who need stuff never actually have enough stuff. Do you know that it's never enough? That you could buy the best brand new car, and next year your car's a year old and not the best brand new car anymore. Do you know that those who live their whole lives trying to make money never have enough? Tom Brady, after winning his sixth Super Bowl, said, I thought it would feel different because it wasn't enough. Because you're held captive to that thing that you set your mind on, your prize on. Those who are always pursuing the best life possible here on this earth will always be discontent and unsatisfied because they're a slave to their own sin, held captive by it. The third thing Nehemiah prays in there is that, he, that they would be plundered. I'll say this about sin. Sin plunders our lives. Sin will take us further than we want to go, keep us longer than we want to stay, and cost us more than we ever wanted to pay. Understand that sin wrecks our lives. The reason why relationships are broken, the reason why the world doesn't work the way it's supposed to, is because of sin. Our actions matter to God. Look at this heavy thing that Nehemiah prays in verse 5. Do not cover their guilt, and let not their sin be blotted out from your sight, for they have provoked you to anger in the presence of the builders. Verse 5 is a scary reality. But if we are honest, that's all of our fate before Jesus. All of us are guilty of sin, permanently on our record before God, and we have made God angry. I think we don't like to think about it that way. We like the the feel-good version of Jesus where God's never angry. But understand, God does not take sin lightly, nor should he. We blatantly disobey the God who created us and breathed life into us. Why should he be okay with us disobeying him? Any more than a parent being okay with their kid disobeying him. It's not okay. We should not be okay with it. We are all guilty before God. And so this idea of what about our guilt not being covered, our sins not being blotted out from God's sight because we have provoked God to anger. Well, as scary as verse 5 is, verse 5 is also a beautiful reminder of what has been done for us through Jesus Christ. We were all guilty before God, but God loved us so much he sent Jesus to die in our place. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only Son, that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus covers our guilt. He goes to the cross and covers our guilt with his blood. He takes our ugly, sinful record and blots out our mistakes in his blood and satisfies the anger of God on the cross. We are all called to live for God, and our actions totally matter. And if we're honest, we can still get it wrong more than we get it right. And it may just sometimes feel like when we're honest with ourselves, Matthew, I'm just so broken. Matthew, I know that Jesus died in my place for my sins, but I just feel like I'm a wreck. I feel like my life is a wreck. My marriage is a wreck. My job's a wreck. I may just feel like, man, I am just this, I'm just too broken for God to be able to work in my life, to use me for his glory. To that, I have my third point. Jesus makes broken things into something beautiful. Jesus makes something beautiful makes broken things into something beautiful. I want to go back to one of the things that Sanballat said about the Jews in verse 2. Nehemiah said, will they revive, or Sanballat says, will they revive the stones out of the heaps of rubbish and the burned ones at that? 
these stones that they were using to rebuild the walls were broken. Nehemiah recounts them as saying that they were rubbish. We don't use that word. I kind of wish we did. Rubbish means trash. They're garbage, useless, without value. Sambal says, will they revive the stones out of heaps of rubbish and the burned ones at that? I wonder if some of you ever feel like rubbish, just burned and broken by the things of this world and the things that you've gone through, the things that you've done. You know you're wrong. Maybe you were lost in sin. Maybe you made a mess of things. Maybe you really feel that. No, Matthew, I totally get it. I am broken, burned, and rubbish. Can I tell you that if you feel that way, that's not a bad place to be. That's not a very comforting thing for a pastor to say. But can I tell you, it's a good place to be because Jesus says this. And when Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came to, not to call the righteous, but sinners. If you find yourself recognizing that you are broken and burned, that just points to your greater need for a Savior. And it's only those who need a Savior that will call upon Him. A person who is unfazed or unaware of their sin doesn't need Jesus. Those who are broken by their sin are very aware of their need for Jesus and call upon Him. In our brokenness, we get to go to Romans 10.13 that says, Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You don't go to the doctor when you're feeling good. You go to the doctor when you're feeling sick and ill. When you are totally aware of your brokenness and the rubbish in your life, it is right that we call upon the name of Jesus. The stones that Nehemiah is using to rebuild the city are the very stones that were once burned and useless and they are now the very stones that have breathed back life into the city. Do you know that when you call upon the name of the Lord, not only are you saved, but 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore anyone who is in Christ is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I agree with you when you say that your life was burned and broken, just rubbish. I agree with you. But the moment that you repented of your sins and put your faith in Jesus, you were a new creation. You are a child of God adopted into his family. So no matter what you have done or how awful it has gotten, when you place your faith and trust in Jesus, you are a new creation. Whatever you felt like your purpose was, whatever you felt like your plan was, it was made new in Jesus Christ. And regardless of how broken or useless you may think you are, God can use you for his glory and kingdom. As long as you have a breath, God will use you for his glory. Those stones have a purpose. They are a part of building the walls of Jerusalem. God will use you where you are, as you are, with the past that you have, in the season that you are in for his glory. Practically speaking, your story of redemption might just be the thing that someone needs to hear in order to put their faith in Jesus Christ. There's no such thing as a boring testimony. There's no such thing as a boring story of God's grace and forgiveness. Because that may be the thing that leads someone to Christ. I've told this story before, but I'll tell it again. There was a family in our church that was struck by tragedy. I got to meet that with that family and share the gospel. And this gal who was really going through a hard time came to church, and her husband was not a believer at the time. But he came to be supportive of his wife. And week after week they came, and the husband was there just to support the wife who wanted to be at church. And then one day, he came up to me and said, Matthew, i got to talk to you. Okay, what's going on? He said, the last few weeks I felt something different in our church. I felt something different while sitting in church. I said, yeah, man, it's the Holy Spirit. And it was there that he, I got to share the gospel with him and he repented of his sins and put his faith in Jesus. Had it not been for that tragedy, a tragedy that I could relate to because a similar thing happened in my life, had it not been for that tragedy, Austin never would have repented of his sin and put his faith in Jesus. God will use the experiences in your life for his glory if you will allow it. You may have made a mess of things. 
If you think about the walls of Jerusalem after being destroyed, destroyed, they were absolutely a mess. Like a toddler's playroom, it was destroyed. And the very same things that were, had made the mess, God uses to make something beautiful. Jesus takes the mess that we make of our life and he uses it to build something beautiful. And do you know what you call it when you take a bunch of broken and burned stones and then have the Spirit of God bring life into them? Do you know what you call that? The church. When you take a bunch of broken and burned stones who have made a mess of their lives, who have repented of their sins and put their faith in Jesus Christ and you bring them together, that's called the church. The church is a bunch of broken and burned rocks who have made rubbish of their life, but they've recognized their need for a Savior and put their trust in Jesus Christ. Everyone's life is absolutely filled with rubbish. Listen, I think that people have this illusion that like Tracy and I's life must just be the bee's knees, that must just be perfect, that everything goes according to plan, it's smooth, nothing bad happens to the Mueller's because he's a pastor. Not true. Absolutely not true. I have a two-year-old who has more bruises on her head than I can explain because she's just crazy and she jumps off her high chair, okay? Sometimes I lose my cool. Sometimes I say things I don't mean. Sometimes Tracy and I get into tiffs. I'm prone to the same struggles you are. My life is just as much rubbish and broken as yours. The only difference between a believer and a non-believer is the believer has confessed their brokenness and traded it for the grace and mercy of Jesus Christ. I am the same broken as you, but I have a Savior that I lean and depend on heavily, and I hope you do too. See, that's the power of the gospel. Jesus in my place for my sins means when I was in brokenness and rubbish, Jesus says, I love you. I'll take your brokenness and rubbish. Here's my perfectly clean record. Take it. It's yours. The, this rubbish and torched rocks turns into the foundation for the thing that God is building to bring glory to himself. It is through the brokenness of man that God uses to proclaim his good news to everyone. There is nothing more powerful to the argument of, well, Christians are all hypocrites. And I go, you're totally right. But Jesus loves me anyway. That yes, I was absolutely sinful and broken, but Jesus died in my place for my sin. And when we get there, when we recognize our need for Jesus and that our actions matter, and that God can use our brokenness to build something beautiful, guess what happens? Verse 6, so we built the wall. And the wall was joined together to half its height, for the people had a mind to work. When all of us broken and burned stones come together for the glory of God, we build the church, much like Nehemiah and the Jews built the wall. But it says that they had a mind to work. Those who know God live for God. And their primary thing that they are doing is building the kingdom of God. One person at a time, bit by bit, God builds his kingdom. Do you know next week we get to celebrate a baptism? Well, we can celebrate that. Not only do we get to celebrate a baptism, but the gal who's being baptized, getting baptized by one of our members who was also baptized in this church, or her family was. And that family, when they first came to church, their husband, Mike, didn't know the Lord at all. Mike one time asked me in a community group, he said, Matthew, isn't the cross a bad thing? And I said, yeah, it was real bad. It was the worst form of torture. He said, Matthew, if the cross is so bad, then why do Christians get tattoos and wear necklaces of this cross? He had never heard the story of the gospel, how it's through the cross that his sins were paid for. That same family, they got baptized. He baptized his two stepkids. We've seen a lot of baptism from that family. And now, Mike's wife, Jackie, will come and baptize Shauna next week. Bit by bit, person by person, the kingdom of God is established. It's not slow, but it is eternal. I mean, it's not fast, but it is eternal. See, the thing being made beautiful in Jesus is you. The more you live for Christ, the more you grow to look like Christ. Practically speaking, the most beautiful version of you is found in following Jesus. I wonder if I could say that again. The most beautiful version of you is found in following Jesus. So let me ask you, are you ready to live for God? Good answer. I'll take it. <laughs> Today I want to ask you, 
Have you put your trust in Jesus Christ? Have you said, Lord, I know I've made a mess of my life. I know that I have turned my life into rubbish and I am nothing but a broken stone, but will you use me? Will you forgive me? If you haven't done that, I want to invite you to do that. And if you're a kid in the room and you have never put your faith in Jesus Christ, but you want to, I want you to tell your parents, hey, I want to, I want to become a Christian. And parents, if you need help with that conversation, I would love to help you. But today I want you to be able to answer the question, what is the purpose of your life? And if it's not following Jesus, can you make it that today? Can you admit you are broken? Broken by your sin. And you need Jesus to restore you. If you can, then you too can live for the glory of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for your grace and your goodness. God, I thank you that when we've made a mess of our lives, when we've been nothing more than just rubbish of broken and burned stones, God, you sent Jesus to die in our place for our sins, that if we would repent and follow you, you would give us a clean record. You'd build us into something beautiful. And God, I thank you that it's through the church that you make your glory known. And I pray for anybody in this room who has yet to put their trust in you, that they would pray today, dear Jesus, I know I've made a mess. I know that I've sinned. Will you forgive me? I want to live for you. And that God, if they could pray that right now, they'd become a Christian. And God, I pray that you would use community life inch by inch, bit by bit, person by person, that you would use us to build your kingdom here. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.